Good evening, everyone. I'm Bridget Bray, the Nancy C. Allen Curator and Director of Exhibitions at Asia Society Texas. At Asia Society Texas, we believe in the strength and beauty of diverse perspectives and stand in solidarity with all people threatened by racism and violence. We trust in the power of art, dialogue, and ideas to combat bias, and we remain dedicated to welcoming all. Welcome to each of you this evening and thank you for making time to be with us. It is a great honor for us to be in conversation with the artist Hong Hong and to hear from her about her work and her approaches to art making. Before we begin, I would like to invite each of you to visit Hong's exhibition at Asia Society Texas, which is called The Mountain That Does Not Describe a Circle, which is currently on view at the museum. It's a great moment to experience Hong's work throughout Houston. She is currently an artist in residence at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft and has an exhibition on view at Artly Houston called Reading the Weather. Please visit their websites for more details, which we will share in the chat. And I'd like to say a special thank you to colleagues at Craft who invited Hong to be in Houston and who I credit with making all of this possible. So thank you very much. In terms of the structure of tonight's program, Hong will start and uh, show some slides. We'll be in conversation and we'll take questions from the audience throughout. So don't feel that you need to wait to put your question in the chats uh, until the end. Uh, please feel free to just jump right in and we'll try to get to as many of your questions as we can um, throughout the course of the evening. And if you miss any portion of tonight's program, it will be featured on our uh, YouTube channel so you can catch up with any portion you might have to miss. We're also going to place Hong's biographic details in the chat so that you can um, take a deeper dive with those. But we'd like to jump in and start as soon as we can hearing directly from Hong. So Hong, without further delay, welcome and let's begin. Uh, did you hear that? Well, yes, I'm, really I hear I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for being in conversation with me and thank you to everybody that made this exhibition possible. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen and showing everyone some images of um, the show, The Mountain That Does Not Describe a Circle. So I think, yes, here we go. So this is the installation view of the gallery space that the viewer would first walk into when they arrive at Texas Asia Society. This is an image of that project that you just saw on the far wall, but in daytime. Detail of the previous work. This is a larger space um, in front of the theater, I think. And this is a detail of the <clears throat> project that we just saw. This is right in front of the theater, um, at the entrance of the theater. And here it is from the outside. Okay, so um, those were the pictures. Thank you for those. I think that's a great encapsulation. And some of our viewers may not be in Houston right now and not have a chance to see it in person. Um, if you are here or are planning to be here before July 25th, we welcome you to come and see in person. Because I think for me, from that first studio visit, uh, the, the surface of the paper was something that I was really struck by having only seen photographs before. Um, <clears throat> and I wonder, can you, can you just sort of talk a little bit about what it was like to respond to the architecture of the building? What about the building was inspiring? What about it was challenging? Uh, why were you interested in sort of playing with that space and seeing what an installation would be like in that space? Well, I think the quality that I find to be most interesting about the architecture at Texas Asia Society is the fact that it's a space that's alive. 
Um, it's a space that's constantly changing in the same ways that a landscape or our bodies might be changing, you know, depending on the light, depending on the weather, uh, depending on the time of day, you know, spatially and color wise, it, it's constantly sort of metamorphosizing. And, and that's a really, that's really cool. Um, I really like the materials that make up the space, you know, there are stones that come from the earth. And I think that's not a surface that I typically would install my work on. And I think, you know, paper comes from trees, which comes from the soil. So I think that there's a natural um, marriage between the materials of the work and the building. Um, so coming into this space and, and making, you know, five to six projects in that space, I think the most challenging part was just the scale, you know, I, my work tends to be exhibited in domestic spaces. So spaces that we inhabit, I've never really worked at the monumental scale. I've never worked at the scale of a building, you know, of a building wall. I've never really, um, you know, and thinking about the tension between the stone and the paper, I've also never sort of contemplated that, you know, how the paper relates to the materials behind it and how the paper relates to each other in a space that is so expansive um, and how the paper changes over time. I mean, something that I'm really interested in is the instability of pigment and of color. And I'm interested in color as a clock and as a window. And one of the things that really excited me about doing this exhibition is the fact that the building is flooded with natural light. And the idea is that these pieces, the colors are not fixed with a mordant. Um, and the idea is that these pieces change as they are exposed to sunlight throughout the show. You know, so as an echo to a building that's constantly changing, this is also an exhibition that's constantly changing. This is a body of work that's animate, that's alive. Um, and yeah, so. That's what I was excited about. <laughs> <laughs> and I think too, you know, I learn so much from each project and each artist has a whole range of things to teach me from a curatorial perspective. And we've joked about this before because of the panicky heart thumps that this gives me, but it, you know, we always think about how to protect the work and how to keep UV from the work and how to, prevent fading in the work. And it's it's been such a great inversion for me to think about actually part of the process of this installation and exhibition is to see how these natural forces affect the work itself. And I think, you know, to the <clears throat> to the extent that hopefully everybody can go and see the Art League Houston installation, where that, you know, you're really playing with that idea even more than with the light in the in the space at Asia Society, I hope will be a, a benefit everybody can take it, advantage of. Yeah, that piece was exposed to all the rainstorms that came through in the last few weeks. And the surface has actually gotten a lot more topographical I bet. because of that. But surprisingly, it hasn't fallen off the wall at all. So it's still <laughs> up. So that's great. <laughs> Keep going, paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What about um, the title for, for many people who, you know, came to us through the website, they saw the title for tonight's talk on material, time, and transference. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I appreciate so much about your practice is how deeply informed by uh, philosophical thinking your work is. And I think that that comes through in the titles. Um, but I wonder if you could take a moment to talk about tonight's title. Oh, for the lecture or for the mm -hmm. exhibition? For the lecture. Okay. Yeah, so um, time, time is everywhere. Time is the material that we move through. We carry time within ourselves and we are also carried by time. Um, my background is in painting. So I spent many years painting and I think painting is a practice that's particularly close to time. You know, I think of each layers each layer of a painting, every layer of medium that you put down as sort of a striation 
or, or a sedimentation mm -hmm. um, within the landscape. And I think of the surface of the painting as very much as, you know, sort of temporal deposits yeah. of action and of material and of different substances. So I've been thinking about time a lot ever since I've been painting and um, paper making is, you know, the word ritual always comes up whenever I speak to people about making paper. Um, it's sort of, it's a seasonal practice, right? I work outside. I can't work year round. Yeah. Um, so there's an aspect to the making of the work that's dictated by the rhythm of time. And, and it's not an industrial time, right? It's a time of the land. It's a time of the the climate, you know, wherever I happen to be. Um, and then the process of making paper itself is so cyclical, right? We're moving through the same sequence of steps every single time that paper is made. Um, and through these steps, you know, the, the molecular composition of this material is not, not not altered, but its physical attributes completely change because we're starting with trees, we're starting with bark, we're starting with a marrow of plants. And then at some point it transitions into a sheet of paper or, you know, or I don't know, it doesn't even look like a sheet of paper, it looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in that sense of alchemy. Um, and I, I think about the different ways that objects around us carry time. And I, I think about the different ways that objects are marked by time. You know, I think of the surface of the earth as a painting. And I, I think of it as a material um, upon which our movements, both individual and collective, are sort of creating lines or um, borders or marks, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think paper as a material has that porousness or openness to touch that so many things in the world have, right? I think openness to touch is the first condition of anything's creation, whether it's a ceramic vessel or a sheet of paper. And we... I mean, it's not just objects, right? It's also humans. We all retain this um, malleability, right? As we move through time and our malleability is also why we deteriorate and there's a sense of disappearance or demise. So I think existence is both additive and reductive because everything begins as a collection of material. Mm -hmm. And then through through time, this material is transformed. Um, and what is what starts as an additive process becomes reductive. And that's where the idea of mark making comes from. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so time, material, transference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Well, and I think too, um, specific to the building, this idea of additive processes through time, if you think about you know, going way back and also how our experience of time shifts. It's not just regimented and very strict. Sometimes you feel like yeah. time is racing past you and other times it's very slow. But if you think about in the Jurassic period, that additive process that resulted in those sedimentary layers that are now the stone walls of the building. I also flash forward to you being in the garden at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft adding material yes. to your mold and decal and coming up with these sheets. And then to have the two of them juxtaposed in the installation is just such a great visual experience for the viewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, the paper is being marked by what's happening in its environment. And there's a lot of valleys on the surface of the paper that you can see. And that's coming from the fact that Houston is so humid, the garden is so humid that the sheets of paper aren't drying. So there's a additive and reductive process that, that are sort of simultaneously happening and in concert with each other, mm -hmm. you know? Right, um, it's just sequential, it's simultaneous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of all thrown together in, in a sort of a chaotic uh, present moment, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. What about for people who understand either from the earlier part of tonight or from uh, looking at your at your website and 
I definitely encourage, uh, we'll put your website in the chat box, but also for people to kind of be able to follow what you're working on in more short orders to follow on your Instagram, which we'll also put in the chat. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the transition from painting to paper and what drew you to paper, because that's a pretty significant shift in your practice. Yeah, so I, I said earlier that I've been painting for a long time. Um, and then at some point, uh, I became dissatisfied with the immediacy of my hand and my body making a mark on the substrate. I, I didn't really enjoy the hierarchy of that experience, right? I'm above, the substrate is below. I am creating the mark. Um, and there's also, I think, a sense of plasticity to painting and and this plasticity plasticity is also why it's beautiful like the every painting is a secret you can only see the surface you can't see the entire body of the painting um but i wanted something that was a little more transparent that i wanted to work with something that couldn't hide what it was from me um at least so you know i was sort of struggling with all of that um and then i I started making paper and all the parts that I loved about painting, you know, as a process that happens within quotidian time as a ritual, uh, you know, as, as something that is sort of a mundane habit and as something that's sort of this intentional act of devotion, all of that, what I loved about painting, everything I loved about painting was also present in paper making. And what I didn't love about painting sort of fell away mm -hmm. as I made that transition. And I, I talked about this a little bit earlier. And what I love about paper is its openness to touch. What I love about making paper is that I'm using my hands as the instrument, that there is no divide when I'm touching the paper between myself and the material. I mean, if we're thinking about the fact that we're sitting on chairs and we really focus on that, we can't really discern where our bodies begin and where the chair begins, right? And, and it's that same sort of seamless connection that I feel when I'm making paper mm -hmm. is that for a moment, I become material, I become matter, and maybe the paper becomes a body, it becomes animate. And, and it's just a space where these hierarchies are kind of being flipped, right? Um, yeah, and I love that. And I love what I love about making paper is that we understand the world through our hands when we're children. And it, it's the same kind of sensorial experience that happens when when I make paper. It's it's about how I touch something and how that something touches me back. Mm -hmm. There's a symmetry that is really beautiful about touch. It's this reciprocal act, you know, two things push upon each other and they're each altered through that meeting or mm -hmm. that encounter. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? I don't know. I yeah. like got lost. No, that we were, <laughs> we were following along right behind you. <laughs> yeah, so don't, don't even worry. Uh, we do have a question from the audience that I yeah. want to share with you. Uh, speaking of your process as additive through time, uh, it takes such a long amount of time for you to produce each piece of paper from the raw materials you're using at what point in the process does the image come to be? Um, do you know what you want to create before you get started or does it come to you as you work with placing the materials in the piece? That's a really good question. <laughs> okay, so um, so the image. Okay, so I, I want to start by saying that I, when I think of the pieces I make, I think of my body as the instrument and as the image which is kind of like a dense sentence. It's like, I don't even really know what I mean when I say that, but I think I do, but, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> um, so I am actually at a crossroads right now and this answer might be really long-winded. So, you know, previous to last, the last two weeks, mm -hmm. I usually plan every pour. Um, I, I don't really draw or paint except for when I make really small sketches of mm -hmm. what one side of the paper is going to look like. Mm -hmm. But the other side is always, you know, carefree. It's, I just get to do, I get one side where I'm really controlled and then another side where I'm like, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> and <laughs> I really like that it, I can sort of straddle both, right? Yeah. 
um, precision and spontaneity at the same time, um, because there's two sides to paper. So, but recently I've started making things that sort of demand to be made. So now I'm making things that I experience in the world. Um, but, But, you know, I think what what unites or the sort of common denominator between the two kind of different ways of working is that I think of looking as drawing. So mm -hmm. when I when I'm making a sketch for a subsequent composition, I always have the 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 previous work up on the wall mm -hmm. and a lot of what happens with of what happens in a particular sketch happens as I'm looking at something. So when I'm making a sort of an echo to, or a response mm -hmm. to that act of looking at that project. Um, and then even with the newer pieces, I'm now I'm completely not sketching at all. I'm just mm -hmm. looking at objects or looking at things. And then I recreate it through the act of remembering mm -hmm. um, a particular experience or a particular object. Um, but you know, sometimes things don't go according to plan. Like I, I like to plan everything, but sometimes I'll arrive to a pour and I see something that I have to do and everything goes out the window. I mean, like two days ago, I set up a pour and I was like, I'm going to make these little moons. I'm going to make a little window. I had this nice little sketch and I was like, yes, I'm ready. I know what I'm doing. And then I showed up and it had rained the night before yes. and the rain was evaporating from the fabric that I work on. And I made these beautiful shadows that were kind of disappearing into the sun, into the heat. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'm not making those moons. I'm going to trace all these shadows. <laughs> so, so I, I can be very precise and very spontaneous and the image kind of comes into being you know, if I'm being precise at one point, if I'm being spontaneous at a different point of the process. Yeah. 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 So well, it just depends. Yeah. I promise everyone in the audience that we are not sponsored in any way by Instagram, but really go in <laughs> uh, because the, the, the pools, the evaporative pools and the fact that you were able to respond to something that happened overnight with weather. I thought that that was a pretty amazing thing for you to share with us as viewers. So I appreciate that personally. It was, Aww. it was super impressive. Aww, I'm glad. <laughs> so hopefully everybody's now doing that while they're listening. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about this idea of, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the body as, you know, a point of contact vessel as agent, but this idea of gesture um, you know, the gesture of the poor, uh, the gesture of you physically circumambulating the mold and decal, um, all of the different ways that gesture figures into these works. Yeah, so paper making is very movement based. It's um, a practice where labor, gesture, experiential connection, and time sort of all coalesce. Um, and sort of talk to each other. So when I'm, you know, I, when I'm pro I, I wanna start from, you know, the processing of the raw materials. When I'm processing repurposed paper or bark, um, I'm exposing these substances to weight and impact and pressure over time so that it becomes the raw material that I work with. And I do this through my body. So it's this accumulation. So the material kind of has a reservoir of physical action, the physical action of pounding, you know, that happens to it, that where I'm literally beating it to a pulp, right? So, so it, that's like already in the material before I even start working. And when I work outdoors, I'm working on a rectangular surface and that's sort of horizontal to land. And I'm walking around the surface and, and sort of, I have a cup in one hand and I'm sort of walking around, I'm gesturing, I'm moving. So the deposit of, of the material is dependent upon what my body is doing. It, it, it is an exact mirror image of where my body is at a specific moment in time, right? So if you look at the surface of the paper, if you know how to read it, it's a map, 
And it's a map of my movements over the course of an hour, over the course of two hours, and over the course of a day. Um, and I think of the pieces as figurative because of that. Um, I think about, I'm interested in the idea of invisibility. Um, I think that obviously being unseen, it's, you know, makes you feel powerless, but I think that there's something really powerful to the act of hiding. So I think of these pieces as, as portraits that are actively hiding or moving away from the viewer, where you, where the viewer is not necessarily privy to, um, to the information that they're yep. experiencing, that, that they need to sort of see it differently in order to understand the kind of almost geological record or um, the record of the paper or where, where the paper almost acts at, as a photographic still, you know, um, of me, mm -hmm. you know, over the course of a day. Um, Right, it's kind of a, it's sort of a time lapse. It is a time lapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely a time lapse. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I'd love to get into a deeper dive about the role of ritual in the works, but I'm wondering if maybe we should take a pause and look at some of the process images. I know that you have an image of a pour and um, some images of, you know, going through the process of what it's like to install the work. So maybe we should hop to that and then we can come back in the conversation yeah that sounds good okay 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 in process behind the scenes winky face <laughs> so i only have one image of a pour and this is it this is a pour that i did in vermont in 2019 um, as you can see, there's that rectangular surface that's sort of sitting on the land. Um, and this is a picture of our install. This is a beginning. I sort of did this sequentially. So that was yeah. when we were looking mm -hmm. and now we're placing. <laughs> We're like, does it really look good here? I'm making the composition. Um, now we're prepping the hardware for the installation. Do you want to talk a little bit about what hardware is at play in, in this work or do you prefer not to? Yeah, no, I'm totally happy to do that. Um, so usually, like, I am all about a low key install. So usually when I show my work, I bring my work to the space and like, here's some tacks and I just go boop, 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 boop. <laughs> and then and then I'm done. Um, and this was a, and this actually was one of the challenges of, of working within this building because it's such a beautiful building. We want to sort of protect it and honor it. So I couldn't really install my work the way that I always have, right? And then we're also sort of working at, at such a large scale. Mm -hmm. So any problem that we might have encountered would have sort of blown up because of the scale uh, of the project. So um, we used these uh, really cool like steel wires. And I, I know that they have a specific name, but I can't remember. Um, and then we like hook them to the wall at the secret place. And then there's metal bars that we use to run behind every single sheet of paper. And then we put magnets on top. Um, so everything is sort of suspended uh, in front of the wall and doesn't, you know, there's no hardware in the, in the actual um, building. Right. Yes. So that's what we did. And that's us on the left. We're like prepping, you know, we also had to do museum best practices. So I never thought about the fact that like metal can't touch paper. And then when we were installing, we had to sort of cover the metal, the side of the metal that touched the paper to protect the paper from um, that material. So mm -hmm. I learned a lot during the install. And then this is us going on the lift, going up the wall, stacking the sheets of paper on top of each other to build the largest project uh, mm -hmm. in this exhibition. 
And I think um, that's it. Yeah, perfect. And I think the thing that, uh, you know, installations teach us time and time again is to be adaptive, right? You have your plan, yes. and you test your plan, <laughs> and then you adapt your plan as conditions come into play. But I think that that's what's so great about having a team come together and exchange ideas and test ideas uh, until they seem to be kind of settled in and working. And what I really loved about this approach was this idea of being, um, it's supporting different experiments in scale. You know, when I came to see your, first came to see your work in your studio space at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, I was thinking about it in terms of kind of almost like a quad structure, like two yeah. on the wall, two on the floor. Yeah. Um, and while there are works on the floor at Asia Society, I just um, am so impressed with how well the work scales up. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, did the scale experiment right away? Did you think like, okay, this is, this is what I want it to do. Or were you, were you still trying to kind of, think about the different effects of the scale experiment as we were working through the installation? Um, well, I remember when we first met at the Texas, Texas Asia Society and I walked through the building and I saw that beautiful, is it the North Wall? Mm -hmm. And I saw that wall and I was like, I wanna make something for that wall. And so that was like intuitive and that was immediate. It was sort of a gut reaction to that space. And, you know, and coming in to do the show and working with y'all, that's really the only thing that I knew. Mm -hmm. That was the only thing I knew is I want to make a project for that wall and I didn't know anything else. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I, I did think that the work could scale up really easily. Um, I think that's one of the most beautiful parts about working sequentially in large scale paper. Um, I have all of these parameters for my work, <coughs> excuse me. So I, I always work with 12 foot by eight foot rectangles. I always cut them into two. I like to work in a really specific, specific groups of colors, you know, blue and this dusty yellow, the dark uh, blacks, and then the sort of light blue. Right. So all of my work is kind of like related to, to each other as as very as sisters or as brothers or as a family. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a mutability and uh, interchangeability that's that's really great about the paper. And I've never been able to experience that, really, um, because I've always exhibited in in really specific spaces and mm -hmm. I've always had my mind set on the quad because I, I had all these reasons and like it has to be vertical and horizontal because of this myth, you know, and, and going into the space at Texas Asia Society, all rules kind of flew out the window for me. Um, I remember we were working in the gallery and I was still really stuck on the quad and I was like, let's get this quad up. <laughs> and it just like did not work. <laughs> I was like, wow, that quad looks so horrible in here right now. <laughs> it was not good. <laughs> and so, so then I had to just open myself up to what the building was asking of me, you know, because the building has such a presence. It's so alive. It has to, the projects, I mean, the best thing about the projects is that they're so changeable. And because of their changeability, I think the installation had to happen in concert with the building. You know, I mean, the pieces were made for the building. And yeah, so I feel like thinking about the scale, I had a lot of, I had one idea about experimentation and then I had some other ideas that I wanted to make happen. Those ideas didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And then it was just sort of um, experimental, yeah. you know? And, well, and, and that, think, that pivot between studio time and exhibition time. Yeah. You know, is that you can be thinking some, developing some ideas in the studio and then coming into an exhibition preparation, be able to test some of them in a way that you can't test them in the studio. Yeah. And it was great. I mean, after we did the piece on the North Wall, I really started thinking about the work as a calendar, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I never really thought of my work that way. I thought of it as a calendar. I thought of it as a clock. I thought of it as a window. 
I thought of it as the sort of slightly ominous, powerful, mysterious being that's mm -hmm. much larger. I, I had a totally different relationship to my own work mm -hmm. that, had, that had never happened in a, another exhibition or another space mm -hmm. before, you know, and a lot of it has to do with the scale and, and the, the specificities of, of that space, mm -hmm. that building. Can you talk, expand a little bit on the idea of sort of coming across or registering as a calendar? Yeah, I mean, you know, I work, I love time, <laughs> all about time. We already <laughs> talked about that. Tonight's so, theme, time. Yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so when I pour, I usually work in the early morning as the sun is rising. And when I finish a work, it usually happens at sunset either that day or the next day. So the idea is that every single sheet of paper is about the birth and the death of a single day. Um, and when I make work, I think of each pour or each sheet of paper as an abstract temporal measurement, mm -hmm. you know, as a single swing of a pendulum, you know, or as the position of the moon in the night sky, you know, or the sun, whatever. And when I make my compositions, my quad compositions, it, they're sort of limited. I, I kind of want the work to be made sequentially. So it's always like two days together or max mm -hmm. three days together. And this exhibition is a first time where um, multiple, multiple days could be next to each other, could mm -hmm. be arranged to each other. And I think that there is a scale thing that happens. Like the idea of accumulation is really important. You know, the idea of a single grain of sand versus an entire beach full of sand, you know, and I think I had an experience that was similar to that, you know, seeing a plant, seeing a single tree versus seeing the entire forest and, and making that exhibition, part of it felt like seeing an entire fall and winter sort of laid out in front of me, you know, and in a really... it really was about the accumulation of time. It was really about how time settles it, it's, and how time congeals mm -hmm. and, and becomes solid, you know, maybe in our remembering our in our memory, whenever we remember something, something congeals a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, that, thank you for that because I think that really helps bring a different sensibility to when people are in the space physically with especially that largest installation. Yeah. And I mean, also, that, Oh, go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. Um, and also, I just want to say like, I, I work in the garden, so there's a lot of foliage in the paper and I've never been able to put sort of smooth sheets of paper next to sheets of paper that were full of leaves because mm -hmm. the trees were shedding their foliage at that time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and seeing all of these different sheets together, I could suddenly pinpoint when each sheet of paper was made in relationship to what was around it, mm -hmm. you know? So the work kind of revealed its own timeline to me, you know, right. in, in the show. What, um, what I'd love to hear you talk about is if um, you can address color um, and how you make color choices, whether that happens in runs or sequences or each sheet is completely unique. I think that that's something that since the exhibition has been on view at Asia Society, I've heard many times is how struck people are by the subtlety of the color, but also by its intensity. And sometimes you don't have both of those qualities at the same time as a viewer of art in museum and gallery spaces. So I wonder if you could talk with us in the audience a little bit about your approach to color in general, specifically with the works that are on view at Asia Society, you know, both either. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, I'm interested in the instability of color. I'm interested in color as a signal for time and for landscape. I'm specifically interested in the role that color plays um, in the sky and in the land. So I, I love blue, 
you know, probably, probably can't tell, but I love blue. <laughs> and um, I love blue because, you know, I moved around a lot as a child. We were in China and then we were in North Dakota and then we were in like Washington, upstate New York, Georgia, Connecticut, all of these different locations. Um, and I didn't always know what home was. Um, but no matter where I was, when I looked up into the sky, it was always there, you know, no matter how much my environments changed, um, the sky was eternal in some way. It was unchanging in this tumultuous sort of beautiful world. Um, and so I always think of blue whenever I think about home, um, because home is more abstract for me. Mm -hmm. And I also think about the idea of distance. Um, I think about the enormous distance that migratory bodies have to travel, you know, whether they're birds or human. Um, I think about the atmospheric perspective of things um, because things that are far away are always blue. You know, I grew up in the mountains and I remember driving through them. The mountains were always blue. The horizon's always blue. Mm -hmm. um, I, so that's my thing about blue. Um, I also, oh, and I also love the sky as the space that we can't access mm -hmm. uh, no matter how much we want to. And that there is this distance of, you know, yearning between us and the sky and the sea. The depth of the sea. But anyway, so I also love dark colors, um, primarily because I'm interested in what they do uh, in the sun. So mm. I recently started working with darker colors to, as an experiment, um, as a way to understand how the fading occurs, mm -hmm. right? And, and as a way of setting myself up to make different marks through the fading of the color. Um, I also think about how darkness becomes light. I think about that transition. Um, I think about, I think about portals. I think about gates. I think about channels. I think, of, I think about the idea of depth and whenever how, whenever something is really, really deep and really, really unfathomable, it's sort of this dark space. Um, and when I work, whenever I make a sheet of paper, I always start with two colors and they're kind of meeting each other in the middle. Um, I'm interested in, so I'm interested in how, okay, so there's a myth and in this myth, um, a God who is sleeping wakes up and cuts the universe or into two, right? So one becomes two. And when I make colors, it's really a way to uh, reference that myth, but kind of in reverse how two become one, or really two become three, and then four, and then five, and then six. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think about the distance that color travels towards each other, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe for the audience that hasn't, um, hasn't had a chance to see the process or can't, has a hard time imagining the process, can you talk a little bit about sort of how that color merging physically happens you know it's buckets with this color buckets with that color yeah 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 so I I make all my raw materials and then I dye it or I don't dye it sometimes yeah. I use straight up you know whatever color the material yeah. is um and they're sort of put into separate buckets uh and then I kind of you know, it's very, I mix them together. So I'll do one, I'll mix two buckets together. So I'll start with one color, add a little bit of the second one, add a little bit more of the second one, and then mm -hmm. add more and more and more until they sort of merge towards the middle, the middle yeah. ground between them. Um, and, and I, I think there are, there are great examples in the installation right now that sh yeah. I feel show that so well. So I yeah. hope people will come and be able to imagine once they're seeing that in person. Yeah. Yeah, it's a color that's in transition, you know, mm -hmm. as a material and, and as a surface. Right. Um, so we have another question from the audience, wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role of ritual in your work. I yeah. think you touched on it a little bit before, but maybe we could do a little deeper dive. Yeah, so I think about ritual in two ways. I think about ritual as 
just a mundane habit, you know, like driving the same road or making coffee in the morning. I also think about ritual as something that is intentional, like prayer, right? Um, or even going home to see one's parents or one's family. And I think what's interesting to me about paper making is that it's between the two, right? So there is, I've, and I've spoken about this before, there is the moment when time becomes bigger than it is. There is a time when, there is that moment when time becomes closer to the eternal, right? And I think that happens in prayer. That happens when we are fully present with something. Um, and then there's that time that is kind of, and that's a time that's really beautiful. And then there's a time that's a little scary. And that's the time of, that's a moment where something seems as if it's always going to happen, as if it's never going to cease. Right. So paper making, depending on the day, can be time expanded um, or time sterilized, you know. Um, and I think, honestly, if you do something over and over and over again, there is there is an element of ritual to it. There is something monastic about the experience of that. And I, like I said, I work, my practice is sort of the biggest circle is the season, mm -hmm. right? So my work is seasonal. And then the smaller circle is the time of the day. I only work at sunrise and sunset. Mm -hmm. And then within that circle is the actual sequence of the processing of the material. Um, and there's also a sense of ritual to the way that I make each sheet of paper. I mean, I'm really interested in circles. Um, and so when I'm making the paper, I'm physically circling the mold and decal sometimes 20 times in one pour. And that's tied to ideas of circumambulation uh, in Buddhism, which is where you're circling a holy relic that you can't see. Mm -hmm. And this act of circling is similar or comparable to an act of prayer. Right. Um, so thinking about the ways that labor can relate to myth um, and bodies can relate to divinity through action, you know. Um, and yeah, and I also think there's something elemental about paper making. Mm -hmm. You know, there is the atmosphere, there is the soil, there is the tree, there is the water. You're working with things that more or less construct our world in some way right you know and they're they're forces that we've honored in in religion and you know mysticism and in so many different ways and then there's something special about that about the privilege of being able to work with water or the privilege of being able to harvest from trees you know, the privilege of being in the sun as the sun rises, you know, and it feels very ritualistic because of those qualities. Right. I think, so for what it resonates with me so well, it is this idea of ritual has different effects of, for different people and also depending on what you're doing. So for instance, when I lived in Nepal, in my neighborhood, there was a really large stupa and when people were circumambulating the stupa, I came to understand that it was doing different things for different people. Sometimes it was physical body being so occupied by gesture that it really cleared a space in the mind. Mm -hmm. But then for other people, the, the physical movement was the practice. It wasn't about sort of clearing a mental space. It was being fully present in the body and really sort of a grounding experience to really be in that microsecond of the moment. And that's what I think has been so fascinating about the feedback that we're receiving about the installation is for some people, they share with us this idea of a great sense of stillness that they experience when they're looking at the work. And for other people, it sort of charges up this great well of energy and they feel a great sort of frenetic quality and I think that that's, even in some of the installation photos that you shared, you know, sometimes there'll be something that really feels like it's a great pool, a great dark yeah. pool on one sheet. And then, especially in the, 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 
the two panels together on the cherry wood wall. There's, you know, that dynamism there of the, the great pool next to the, the slope with the gradation. And I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit about, you know, sort of tying it back into those juxtapositions that you're, that you're choosing. Um, you know, the, the title of the exhibition, The Mountain That Does Not Describe a Circle, and those two panels in particular on the cherry wood wall, you know, how you came to feel that those needed to be together. Yeah. Um, I think that was one of the last pieces that we did for the show, mm -hmm. right? It was sort of the punctuating moment um, for the install. I, well, the mountain that does not describe the circle talks about the idea that being higher um, brings us closer to divinity or to our gods who for a lot of us live in the sky or, you know, and through just, you know, historically speaking. Right. Um, and, and I'm also interested in creation myths and in a lot of creation myths, the world is an egg, right? So thinking about Pengu, which is the Chinese creation myth, all that existed in the beginning was an egg, which was then cut open um, by the swing of the God's ax. So I, I wanted to tie themes of verticality and horizontality together. You know, I when so when I make work, I'm always outside. And I think about the rectangular structure that sits on the ground as a space where the work can sort of mimic the arc of the surface of the earth at that particular location. Um, and I think of the land as similar to a newly formed sheet of paper as this malleable substance that is constantly changing, uh, changed by what's around it, right? Even though it seems permanent to us, it is actually changing. Um, and I make my work beneath the sky. So a lot of the water has to evaporate from the work because paper making is all about water. You cannot make paper without water but the water has to evaporate into the atmosphere for the, for the work to become a cohesive sheet of paper. So when the paper is being made, there's this vertical movement that happens between the object that's sitting outside and the sky. And I was listening to this lecture by an amazing artist named Khalil and he was talking about soil as the skin of the earth. And that really struck me. And I'm like thinking about the sky, I'm like, oh, well, if if the soil is the skin of the earth and the sky is the skin of the universe and, and the paper comes into being between these two spaces, right? And if we think about the enormity of the earth and then the enormity of the universe, this distance seems quite small, mm -hmm. but, but, and yet it's so immense to us, right? So, oh my gosh, I had a point and I like totally lost it. So, so the, the mountain that does not describe the circle references the movement of water from the paper into the sky. It's okay. this invisible mountain. It's this invisible movement that happens and the water becomes rain, it becomes weather. And I also think about mountains as structures where temples are held because of the elevation of, of this desire to know the unknowable in a way right mm -hmm. because earth is among it's everything we know mm -hmm. yeah. yeah and then the universe is everything we don't know mm -hmm. even though i don't think that that's so clear you know right. um and then i was also thinking about the mountain as the, this accumulated structure that happens when soil is deposited layer by layer by layer by layer sort of similar to the paper or a painting and then i was also thinking about how Every mountain is a circle if you're sort of swimming at the bottom of it, mm -hmm. right? If you're sitting at the bottom of a mountain looking up. Yeah. So if you're a sheet of paper on the ground prone and there's mm -hmm. an invisible mountain above you, it's a circle. Yeah. And that's the only space where that moment of recognition can occur. Mm -hmm. But that moment of recognition is impossible, you know, 
And it's very similar to that moment of ascension, which is also impossible for us. Yeah. So the title is about impossibility. And I really wanted a piece that would talk about the tension of that, of the yeah. impossibility of experience or living or something. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. It sort of builds on what you were just talking about, but kind of brings it into the installation space. Um, some pieces are laid out horizontally and some are hung vertically. What makes you decide the orientation of a piece? Do you know when you're looking at a sheet, this is definitely meant to be in the vertical? Do you know when you're looking at a sheet, this is definitely calling out to be horizontal or does it change depending on how you're bringing elements together for a total installation? Does that make sense? Yeah, it definitely changes. Um, I, I've so I, I try, I think like my nature is actually more spontaneous than I think it is. And I'm like, I love rules. <laughs> I am all about rules. And so when I make my work, I think this is it, you know, mm -hmm. this is the composition, but something always happens when I bring the work into each space and specifically this space where again, the beauty of sheets of paper is that they're mutable. They can be vertical. They can be 45 degrees. They can be horizontal. And it's all about the conversation that the work has with what's around it, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, when they're made, they're in conversation with the landscape. And when they're being exhibited, they're still in conversation with a landscape. And that landscape is a building or a space or an architecture. Mm -hmm. So I, I do always think I know, and sometimes I do know, but then sometimes I don't know. So it's like, I know and I don't know. So I don't Sometimes know. you know, and additional new knowledge comes to life. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, didn't know. Guess I didn't know. <laughs> no, now I know. Um, we have maybe we can just squeeze in one last one, and then I'll leave you in peace. But um, when you talk about time congealing, earlier we talked about time kind of congealing through our remembrance. Um, I start to think about clouds. Clouds are this formless thing that become form only when we frame them. I'm curious whether you think about that relationship between the formless and the form. If so, if time, the formless thing that your work gives form to congeals, or is there something else that you're thinking about and giving form to? Does that question, you want me to reread any part no, of that? No, no, I understand. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Well, I would like to say that everything we do is always giving form to time. Art is not the exception. Um, I'm not sure what time is. I'm not sure if time is material. I'm not sure if it's physical. I'm not sure if it's conceptual, intangible, tangible. I'm not sure. Um, but I do think that through time, things, I mean, there's a certainty to form. I talked about this and that it, it, it's additive and reductive. And, and, and I think for me, maybe like the goal of existence is something similar to disappearance. Mm -hmm. And I think when I make paper, I'm always thinking about the material, working with the immaterial to become another material to then be immaterial again, because mm -hmm. the paper is not going to be here forever in right, the same way that- yeah, that in the same way that we're not going to. So, so it's like object, it's like matter, you know, thought to energy, to matter, to object, to matter again. Mm -hmm. And then what I love about making paper is that it returns me to matter. Mm -hmm. I mean, what I, what I mean by that is so physically demanding is that I can feel myself becoming matter mm -hmm. when I make paper. And I think maybe the paper is just about that is just, I don't really have a good answer to that question. You know, I think it is about time and I think it is about matter. And I think about it, I think it's about the different states of matter and the different manifestations of matter and what happens to matter. Right. You know? Well, I feel like this idea of, you know, where are you in this sort of continuum of congealing or releasing? Yeah. You know, that whole um, assessment that we can make when we're looking at the paper or when you go to Art League Houston and 
you see, wow, the, the surface of the paper is really getting exaggerated by this exposure to the elements, you know, even yeah. just sheet by sheet, I feel that your work brings us into a kind of consideration of these much larger questions. Thank you so much. It's been such a treat. I'm glad that you were able to come and join the audience and answer their questions. And uh, I personally enjoyed it so much. It's been a delight to work with you. Uh, but I'm really glad we had the chance tonight to sort of take a deeper dive in conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for being in conversation with me. I mean, working with you has been nothing short of a pleasure. And I'm I, I can't see anyone who might be listening, but thank you so much for <laughs> joining us in conversation or just, you know, whatever, wherever you are. Thank you. And just to sort of a recap, if you joined us late and you want to catch the beginning of what Hong shared when we first started, uh, tonight's talk will be um, available through Asia Society Texas's YouTube channel. And again, a huge thank to, uh, thanks to all of you in the audience, to Hong herself. Please come and see us at Asia Society Texas so you can enjoy the installation in person. None of these exhibitions or programs are possible without our wonderfully generous donors. Exhibitions at Asia Society Texas are presented by Nancy C. Allen, Chinny Jun and Eddie Allen, and Leslie and Brad Booker. Major support comes from the Brown Foundation, the Houston Endowment, and the City of Houston through Houston Arts Alliance. Generous funding is also provided by the Anchorage Foundation of Texas, the Clayton Fund, Texas Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, Wortham Foundation, Agnes Sue Tong and Oscar L. Tong, United Airlines is our official airline partner. Funding is also provided through contributions from the exhibition's patron circle, a dedicated group of individuals and organizations committed to bringing exceptional visual art to Asia Society Texas. And of course, if you enjoyed tonight's program, we invite you to support all things exhibition related at Asia Society Texas. You've seen the link in the chat and uh, that will be a way for you to come and um, support everything that you've enjoyed about this evening. So again, thank you so much Hong and thank you to everyone in the audience. Hope to see you in the building very soon. <laughs>